Hey folks, and welcome to another video from a plain truth info. We've got an incredible, incredible interview from a fire captain who also has been training fire captains who has experience for over 30 years. This is one of at least two interviews we're doing with firemen, or local firemen who are going on record, on record to tell us what happened in these fires and their versions. But anyway, uh, let's listen to uh, Captain John Lord. He lives in uh, Lake County. He's going on record. He's a very brave and very smart man. Uh, and this is his story about what he feels happened on the night of October 9th and uh, what his uh, take on from his professional of over 30 years experience uh, happened in these fires here that started October 9th, middle of the night, 80 mile an hour winds whipped up nowhere, blue lights everywhere and uh, caused over 2,000, 3,000 degree temperatures and took up over in this area over 4,700 homes. But there's fires going on everywhere, folks. All right, Mr. John Lord, here we go. What a career. We're uh, the November 1st, uh, Santa Rosa, California. Uh, we're th here with uh, Captain John Lord. And John's going to tell us about his experiences from since uh, the fires began October 9th, John. So, October 9th, my sister was up at my house in Lakeport. And uh, they left around five o'clock in the afternoon and uh, I texted her a couple of times um, as they were driving home this is not, Sunday this is Sunday this night is Sunday night this Sunday afternoon okay not realizing that anything was going on and talked with her the next day and she said that the winds as when she went home they went down through Napa Valley the winds were like nothing that she had ever experienced. They were in a they were in a half ton Chevy Tahoe, and it was loaded, so it had gear in the back, so it had plenty of weight to it. And she said they were being buffeted and blown all over the road. Fortunately, her boyfriend was driving, and he was absolutely shell shocked by the time they got to Danville. He was so freaked out by the experience. And and before we get into this, so what's your experience and background? My experience and background is, is that um, I have been in the paramedical field over 40 years. I started um, in the Navy in November 1974. I uh, was in the medical field by early 1975 and I uh, got trained as a paramedic before I got out of the Navy. And I did two and a half years with private ambulance in Concord. and. Um, and then uh, took a job with Petaluma Fire Department on um, in November, I believe, of uh, 1981. September, September, I think, 1981. So I was one of the original six paramedics there, hired there, and cross-trained as a firefighter. And uh, during that time I was in there, I earned um, my associate degree in fire technology, a bachelor's degree in business management, um, I have my fire officer certification and was working on my chief officer certification when I retired. So I have about 28 years experience in the fire service. Wonderful. And you would teach firefighters or you have some teaching? Yeah, I, I have about 25 years uh, teaching experience working with the paramedic academy, the firefighter one academy and the fire technology program. and. Uh, uh, myself and a friend of mine developed a course that is now standard practice for the state, which is uh, building construction for fire protection, and began to roll that out. So about 25 years uh, teaching experience. And you were showing us this big book album of awards <laughs> and certifications. I mean, what, what, are your, uh, what are you most proud of as far as awards or achievements, John? Well, my, the things I'm most proud of is new technologies that I brought into the to the uh, fire service against uh, great adversity, mm -hmm. which is uh, external cardiac pacing. Um, that was an immense project and uh, involved multiple organizations that I worked with and uh, uh, kind of provided a leadership role and uh, coordination. And we were actually able to um, to impact the the state leadership to allow that to be added into expanded scope of practice. So anybody in the state of 
California that's using external pacing on a cardiac patients is a result of my work. And not just my work, others worked on, on the project as well. Um, I forget what the doctor's name was in San Francisco, was, was also doing uh, work on the trial study, but um, our, our work was instrumental in getting him to add that skill to expand the scope of practice. I'm extremely, extremely proud of that. I also led a task force in Sonoma County uh, to build a quality improvement uh, program, an integrated uh, program within the county. And I'm very, very proud of that work. And uh, finally, the, probably the, the third thing is um, uh, getting advanced life support services added to our frontline engines and our truck in the city of Petaluma. So we had the equipment when there was a paramedic assigned to the engine, they actually had the equipment to be able to work and provide that level of care. Gotcha. And so going back to the night of the fire, so we're talking the afternoon, Sunday afternoon, the 8th, I believe, and uh, I'm here in Santa Rosa, and I didn't notice any change until about 10.30 at night. I mean, I wonder, you, you, you live nearby here, um, and, and until your daughter called, were you aware the weather my was sister, changing? My sister. Your sister, I'm sorry. Uh, were, you, were you aware anything was there going was on? There was nothing in going on in Lakeport. The, the winds were absolutely still, and uh, um, there was nothing going on. No, no evidence of any aberrant weather, any fronts coming in anything like that. So when did you start to notice? What, what, when, when did you first occur something was going on? When I first found out about it was the following the following morning. And phone call or? Um, I uh, connected with my sister. She told me what had happened. I became aware of the fires and um, and uh, started uh, kind of doing reconnaissance on them. Because we had in Lakeport, if you look at a, a large map, we had basically fire on three sides of us. So, um, kind of a, in a triangular shaped pattern. Uh, there was fire, a big fire all the way on the other end of the lake. Um, the one in Redwood Valley was going on and then uh, the one near, uh, in Matt's, near Matt's house at times fire that burned into Santa Rosa. Did you call Matt in the morning and compare notes of what you guys were seeing? Not, not as of that point, no. So you were just trying to figure out what the heck's going on. I was just trying to figure out what the what the heck's going on. And when you talked to your sister down in Napa and got the heads up that there was some big winds and you weren't feeling it, and then all of a sudden three fires are going on all around you, you turn on the news that Napa and Santa Rosa are also ablaze. I mean, I think you're up in the pocket fire, they called it up there. Is that what they're calling it? The Let's see, which fire was it? It was... Um... The Redwood Valley one, I think they're calling the pocket fire. That's the pocket fire. And then the, the one on the other side of the lake, I was watching really closely because it was burning into a cul-de-sac formed by the lake itself. That that was the, the prevailing winds were pushing it in that direction. So it could only burn to the water. But what I was concerned about is if we got a wind shift and it hooked around and would have burned down Highway 20 uh, toward Lakeport. So, when, so I was watching that one really closely. When you started to see on, probably on TV the devastation when they started showing these homes and complete uh, dustification, evaporation of, of, of all the buildings, what, what were you thinking as a fireman? Well, I don't watch TV. Uh, okay. So. <laughs> I haven't watched TV in 25 years. So I get my information from the Internet, and I have my sources that I go to. And... Um, the, the first thing um, that I noticed, I think, was the uh, rapidity of the fire movement, which seemed abnormally fast to me, considering that there was no weather fronts or winds or anything that, that I was aware of that would have driven the fires that quickly. And also the number of fires was extremely alarming. Where did all these fires come from? Mm -hmm. How did they all start at once? And so I, uh, I started digging, and um, uh, when I started digging, I started looking at the research that was available for uh, um, directed energy weapons, and uh, what I started reading actual government documents that people had put up, various people had put up on the website, and uh, um, looking at the destruction, which I have never seen in my career, the totality of the destruction on the structures. There was absolutely nothing left of the structures except foundation. Now, I've seen that with other fires, 
but not where it moves like that. Not where the fire is moving and one side of the street everything's fine, the other side of the street it looks like a like a, a nuclear war zone. Never seen anything like that. Um, what, so, what other options could there be besides a, a, a high torch directed energy weapon that you could consider as a possibility in your experiences of all the fire fighting you've done? There's none that I could think of. There's none so this is the only plausible this explanation is, that's being the presented. the only plausible explanation in my opinion. That's the conclusion that I was brought to based on my almost 30 years of experience. And you know that steel melts in thousands of degrees and yes. all this and to see steel bent like that but have vegetation and plant life and eucalyptus well, the trees. Holes, the holes that were burned through the hoods of cars all the way through the engine block are a little bit suspicious. Wasn't that crazy? Yeah. The aluminum on the ground that had melted to the ground where the guy that was walking over it? Before. Okay. That I've seen before. We had a tanker fire, um, a gasoline tanker fire on 101 and those, the the gasoline fuel is moved around in aluminum tanks, like that thick aluminum tanks. And that one caught on fire and uh, melted the aluminum like that. Right. So I have seen aluminum melt like that in a structure, a structure fire or other fire. Let, let's talk for a sec about how a firestorm creates. And it's my understanding that a fire has to build its fuel and consume its oxygen to intensify over time as heat builds up over time. But we're getting, we're having this firestorm. These fires happen in a matter of a couple hours and created thousands of degrees temperature without any uh, provocation from fuel to build itself. It just happened, it seems like. Yeah, uh, it seems like. Right, I mean, that's the only, I mean, it just happened over a couple hours and then it was just about, you know, how the fires were spreading. But the initial destruction was here, there, and everywhere and everything down to the bone of, of the homes, literally where all that's left is the fireplace, but there's no iron tubs, there's no granite counters. I mean, we went through uh, old Redwood Highway here and went Mark, Mark Rest Road, and it was just amazing how there was nothing left. I mean, nothing. Yeah. And the fires, you know, they were out there within a few hours. So what could have caused that? A, other normal, than a normal temperature up high in a fully involved structure fire is around 1,100 degrees. Mm -hmm. That's normally what we consider operating fire conditions, about 1100 degrees. And the fact is, is that there's a lot of plastics inside households right now, so plastics um, liberate a lot more heat than wood would, about, right. tw about twice as much. Did you hear anything about blue lights being seen and yes. anybody saying that? I saw the, I saw the photographic uh, evidence on the internet. Did you see, I heard of anybody else commenting that they've seen blue lights, like they've been commenting on my site, that I saw blue flashes, I saw it, and other people have been saying it as well. Yeah, just some in passing, but I saw I saw actual photographs that people took from their cell phones, their cameras. All right, and then, and then how do you feel about learning that the Planning and Zoning Commission is having the exact same footprints nearly as these fires were, and that now they're declaring some of these areas from a previous fire that could be deemed a fire, a severe zone that maybe they shouldn't be rebuilt now. Have you any comment on that? Um, well, I guess my comment would be that I'm fully aware of Agenda 21 and that it doesn't surprise me one bit. And have you talked to other firemen as well about this? Are they on the same page as you? Or are they even questioning this? Or what are they thinking? Uh, yes, two others. Two others I've, I've talked with directly about it and are we're all in agreement that something very strange something is, very, very unique strange. and new has happened yeah. right right and and have you been to tour the areas have you looked around at some of the areas only what i only what I've, I've seen on the internet from overhead gotcha and i just drove down 101 so what i could see from the freeway so what you just conjecture what do, what do you think these firemen who are looking at these fires they've never seen before and talking among themselves how do you think they're are they talking about it what do you think they're because they've never seen anything like it either and you know, I, you know, listening to that Berkeley engine number six that came up and their whole journey through it, they were totally uh, astounded where they couldn't even set up a, a base station to, 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 to start fighting from because everything was on fire. We have we have a 100,000 square foot Kmart completely torched by 3 a.m. in the morning where these fires leapt across a, a eight lanes of road and torched the Kmart on the other side of the road. What kind of fire does that? Uh, a fully sprinkler building. 
Well, yeah, that's the other thing is California has one of the highest sprinkler laws in the, in the country. <sighs> Not natural phenomena. Unnatural phenomena. I, like I said, I've never seen anything like it. And the other thing is, is that um, amongst some of the courses that I worked on, I taught a course, um, co-taught co with others. That's where this, this t-shirt comes from. Um, we flew back to uh, Florida twice and worked with these guys one time uh, for a week and uh, taught a course on firefighter safety and survival. And so I uh, have done a lot of case studies on different fires, both wild land and uh, uh, structural fires where uh, uh, firefighters have been killed. And um, I am telling you based on, on my studies of actual case studies that I've never seen anything like we just experienced in Northern California. So who would be responsible in the greatest fire in California history to make a determination of what went down now for the officials? Since we have no official story three and a half almost weeks out, who should be making that call and, and, and letting everybody know the, the, what they believe happened? Well, I think that that ultimately depends on how they bump it around within the government organizations and who, who, uh, who they put in charge of the lead on it. And and do you have any? I mean, they won't come out and say directed energy I, weapons. Uh, they can't. Not likely. And so they're having a tornado fire. I've heard bandied about Diablo winds, which I've lived in Northern California all my life. I never heard that term before until they just started throwing it out there. PG&E poles. Uh, serial arsonist. Serial arsonist. Yeah, they have the, uh, the uh, somebody was saying there was some jeans on fire on a road with matches in it. Um, things like that, but it's amazing that we're not even having the greatest fire in history, even a, a, a scenario being brought to the front about how this possibly could have happened, but yet over 100,000 people are, are lost their homes, and now they're meeting tomorrow with the EPA and FEMA who've moved into Santa Rosa along with the military police, and they're going to dictate what these people's lives are going to be going forward if, if we don't get to them and start helping them ourselves, right? Right, right. And you, you were talking about the spiritual journey. You want to you talk about how this is a spiritual war? You want to get into that at all? Not really right now. Uh, but I would like to say this, is that my heart goes out to all those people that have been victimized by this fire in one way or another. Those that were lost, uh, those that were injured, uh, those that lost property in their homes. And uh, I don't know what's going to happen, but... Um, I think that um, as we as human beings and as a community come together um, that we can help one another more than anticipating any help from the government and that's my two cents on it. And, and are you willing to go and talk with other firefighters and see if they can help out and other people can be brought up to speed that we need to come together as a community because Absolutely. you know because my feeling is we just got attacked. And the firefighters, you got to understand nature of beasts with firefighters is that we, uh, we love helping people. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that's what firefighters are all about. So, I know um, many, many just outstanding people in the service. So, um, not everybody's aware of what's going on, but... That's the way it always goes. Well, and you're the first responders. That's what we always call you in all the letters and um, over the freeways. Thank you, first responders. And I, I want to thank you personally, John, for coming here and also for all the career, all you've done to help others and give. Because one thing I've learned about firemen is they get into business because they want to help. They get into business because they want to, quote, save lives. And they're first responders that put themselves on the line. Here they go after a fire they've never seen before in the middle of the night called to I mean, this had to be called the Beast Fire. I mean, this this is so amazing what just happened here. Until you're actually seeing it and being around it, you can't appreciate the devastation that went on in certain areas and then just over the hill, completely normal, natural, everybody's back to everyday life. And so we have so many people that are displaced, but with the fire community, firemen community, other uh, first responders that want to build, we're, we're you know out of the ashes going to come something better. 
but it's going to be a community organizing effort, not uh, dictating from the federal government down to these people who lost everything, and now they're being told they can't go back to their homes, and we're going to give them some opportunities because we care. And all of us are going to do it because we care, and it's not going to be about us. It's, we're going to join the firemen. We're going to join other community leaders, but this is going to be exciting. And, and the spiritual part I was, I was bringing that we were talking about earlier is this is about empathy. This is about giving to the greater good of all. And this is what we're supposed to be all be about, I, I feel. And so with your giving and b giving your time here to go on record, which is big, uh, you know, thank you, John. I mean, and thank you, uh, Captain East Bay, <laughs> for your input as well. And hopefully this will shed a little light and others will step forward and not be afraid to speak their truth about what they know. Because a lot of people have secrets and we need to all come out now and we need to come together and, and, and really you know, be the change we wish to see. So, so thank you, John, for your time. Really appreciate it. You're welcome. And there is only one truth. <laughs> this is the plain truth out. Thank you. Good job.